Rural Heritage on RFD TV is brought to you by Rural Heritage Magazine, a bi monthly magazine featuring articles about farming and logging with draft animal power, small scale diversified family farming and homesteading, and other aspects of our rich rural heritage. Rural Heritage Magazine, borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. For subscription information, please call 319 362 3027 or order online at www.ruralheritage.com. Several years ago, we visited the antique farm vehicle, implement, and tool collection of Tom Renner of Belleville, Illinois. Ever since that visit, we've wanted to come back and spend some more time with Tom, talking about some of the unique and interesting farm wagons he has in his collection. Last summer, we got our chance. This is a Lansing box wagon right here. Uh, it's in good shape yet. Um, uh, basically Lansing, Michigan and that, uh, got the seat on it. It's just a double box, double board wagon. So that top board can come right off. It's locked in right Right. Here. The top board can come right off on this wagon right here. And it's kind of no nice to, to just notice basically the fancy hardware they had to clip those boards on and make them grain tight. Most of them had a metal strip in here to divide them. And, that, and for the age of this wagon, you know, it's probably <clears throat> 125 or more years old uh, for it to be in this condition. First of all, it had to be taken care of well, but it had to be built well too. What do you think this piece was for? Was this for a buckboard? No. I think this is for the third, the third tier. Okay. Yeah. And basically, when you took this wagon to the elevator and that they would have had some kind of a hoist that would have opened this thing up, but you stood back here when you unloaded this wagon and you used this, this end gate for kind of a throttle so you could throttle it going into the pit or, or whatever you're unloading it into. And, and uh, also it made it so you could leave the top board in place and just take the bottom one out. But this was basically a throttle back here for adjusting the flow. Hmm. The hardware is really pretty ingenious on these wagons. They've got some very good, simple patents that did last a long, long time. These tie bolts here kept the wagon straight. And that. It's got a pretty big cowl on there. It's a nicely made wagon. When you got this wagon, was it like this or did you have to clean it down to the paint? We gave it about two or three wash jobs with Murphy soap. Almost every wagon in here gets a minimum of three coats of linseed oil. And that, a lot of them, it's probably the, the first time they've had linseed oil put on them. And, that, and they just soak up the first coat or two like you can't believe. I know in this museum we've used over 500 gallons of linseed oil on wagons and wooden mines in here. It's just uh, an endless amount of oil. But it does really preserve the wagons. If you cut a piece of wood later on that you would have treated with linseed oil, you can see if you keep treating it, it just keeps soaking in deeper and deeper. And it, it, it really does preserve it. Plus it brings out the color in the paint. That's and the wood would swell a little bit too. It yes. would tighten things up a little bit. Definitely, definitely, definitely. This is a lumber yard <clears throat> delivery wagon here. And uh, we totally refurbished it and that, and uh, uh, all the hardware and everything on its original. And basically, they would have used it for primary delivering lumber and two by fours and, and things like this. It was just basically utility. You could use it for about anything in that. No sides, just these removable stakes and that. And even though lumber can be kind of heavy, it's a fairly light duty wagon because it's a fairly light right, running the, <clears throat> the wheels are not very heavy on on the wagon, and that, uh, uh, it does have the steel axles and uh, yeah. a good set of springs on it. Yeah, but, uh, uh, How old do you think this wagon is? Any, any way to guess? I'm sure this wagon is close to 100 years old. What do you suppose this hook is for? I, don't, I, I imagine to probably use it for tying down yeah. lumber yeah, from right. side to side. Sure. 
The floorboards, in a way, <coughs> are original. Really? Uh, look, looked originally. Wow. <coughs> we did sand them, and uh, uh, we linseed all them. A couple of coats first, and we put the poly clear on top of it uh, to bring off the grain of the wood net. But uh, I, I do believe the floor is, is an original floor. Nice firm ride here. Yeah. <laughs> With this yeah, thing. There's, yeah, there's no spring yeah. to it. Yeah, there's no spring to that, you know. The only spring you had was the springs down here on the axle. Right. The next wagon over here is a bird cell from South Bend, Indiana. Uh, this company was known primarily for their thresh machines and clover hauler. They had a real big clover hauler back in the day. And uh, uh, I've not seen that many of their box wagons out, but this is one that survived. And uh, it's still in pretty nice shape. Also, but that's what bird cell was primarily known for was the clover hull. And tell me what that is, clover hulling. Is that taking the seed off of the clover? Right. Basically, the clover hauler was like threshing wheat, and I, <clears throat> but with clover, not you had a, a seed that was very, very, very small, and uh, it, it took kind of a specialized machine with a, uh, a special cylinder and concave in it to separate the seeds from the fine pieces of clover stem in that. And they'd be doing that to make clover seed to plant. Right. They wouldn't and, be feeding <clears throat> that, they'd be planting that clover. Right. You would feed clover before it goes to seed. Right. And back in the day, you know, everybody raised clover because you primarily followed your clover with corn because clover put nitrogen back in the soil. I mean, back in those days, we didn't use anhydrous ammonia or anything like that. We used clover. And clover also, <clears throat> you cut a cop for hay. You had a lot of horses to feed, so you needed a lot of clover. It was a crop that almost every farmer raised in wheat. Today's high production wheat that's 70, 80, 90, 100 bushel an acre, you couldn't raise clover in it because the wheat's so thick, the clover would get enough light <clears throat> to survive. But so clover's almost an unheard crop, crop anymore. This is a David Bradley wagon right here, basically a <clears throat> Sears. Uh, you could actually order one of these out of their catalog and that, but uh, I remember we had the Sears Farm Store here in Belleville 50 years ago, and I remember them selling box wagons there. At that time, they were rubber tire box wagons, elevators, and and, and some uh, farm tools there. You could buy side delivered rakes and and uh, sulky plows and that type of stuff and that, but this is one of the items. Uh, actually, if Sears, you could order a home, you know, and you get what today would be a prefab home. And you think, I don't have a price on what this wagon would have cost, but <clears throat> looking back through some of the old John Deere catalogs that we had, you know, a wagon like this was probably about $80 back in the day. You know, that's an unheard amount uh, of money by our standards today. But uh, I, I don't remember what year it was, but I know there were several of the John Deere box wagons that were available. And it was priced per board one board, two board, three board wagon, and that, but I think a two board wagon with a running gear, and they came in a crate, was about 80 bucks. <coughs> and so then would the farmer assemble it? I'd say in most cases the farmer did assemble it. He probably threw the, the crated up wagon on his wagon and took it back to the farm and put it back together at the farm. Yeah. And that. This is a a town and country wagon. This is a wagon you basically would have uh, used to take the to town to bring home your su your supplies. It wasn't meant for hauling corn or or any type of grain. And that what's a little bit unusual about it is it's got one wooden fenders, and these are the original wooden fenders. You can see that they uh, are showing a little bit of age, but they basically are still in good shape. I'm sure it was oak. And uh, uh, here again, we're looking at a wagon that's over 100 years old. It was kept inside. It had to be kept inside, you betcha. Now some wagons have pretty dramatically different sized front and back wheels. A few wagons have the same sized front and back wheels. Is there a particular reason for why one might be more than the other? I wouldn't know what it would be, Joe. Yeah. Um, not sure the heavier wagons, what they call the mountain wagons, you know, had the wide wheels, the four inch wide wheels and that, and uh, heavier fellows and spokes and hubs and all that type of stuff. But um, 
outside of the smaller wheel wagon would cut under in this area right here a little shorter. <clears throat> Might be of some advantage, but uh, most all the box wagons weren't cut under enough that you could put the wheel underneath the front. This one's got so, a guard on it to, to, to protect the wagon. Right. This is a wagon right here that I bought at a sale in Indiana, and it was, I guess at best, a very, very pale pink color. In it. But it was a pretty solid wagon, and I was, you know, you could just faintly see this paint on the side, I mean very, very faintly. And I brought it home, and uh, we walked, gave it a bath three times with this Murphy soap, and uh, got the the dirt and the grime off of it. And the more we washed it, the more the color started to come out. Well, then we gave it a coat of uh, linseed oil. And all of a sudden, I could start to see a little bit of riding back here, you know. And the second coat, it got more. And by the time we got the third coat, it came <clears throat> out pretty clear. And says, Schwartz and Miller, maker, Belleville, Illinois. So here's a, a wagon I found a couple hundred miles from home that uh, by accident turned right back up in its hometown. And it didn't have the split end gate on, it had the straight end gate, so basically these end gates had to go up. Well, a lot of them got the, the hinged end gate, which I really prefer yep. in that, so. Um, I don't know why. I can see where somebody continually got a bar and it raises up because they had yeah. to weed it or something like that. You had to get it up a little bit to, <clears throat> to get the wheat to start to come out. Right. Uh -huh. A lot of wagons had a shoveling board that folded up like this and stood up about, a, about the height of the, of the triple box of a triple box wagon, and it folded down. And then you pulled, you know, one of the boards up and let the grain come out on a shoveling board and then shoveled off the shoveling board because just to, to dig into a wagon full of ear corn or wheat or whatever you're hauling was virtually impossible. So you had to be able to have a place to start. That's what the shoveling boards were about. The shoveling boards are hard to find. A lot of them have disappeared over the time and weren't in later years used, so a lot of the shoveling boards hit the, the junk pile 50, 75 years ago. It's got a piece of iron over here, a brace, that there's no reason to, but the blacksmith or whoever put a little curly cue on it. Yes. And there's no reason for that, but it's ornamental. Just dresses it up. A lot of these parts on his wagon, especially a wagon like this, I'm sure this was a, a low production wagon. And I'm, I'm sure they basically made them for farmers in the community. And it's hard to tell if they made five or 105 or 500 of these wagons. I imagine that would be the tops at most. But, you know, like you say, this was done in a blacksmith shop. They probably made a half a dozen of them at a time and put them on the wagons as, as they basically build them. <coughs> this is not stenciled. This is all hand-painted script on the side. Uh, it's well done. Uh, nothing's identically matched from side to side, but it still looks very good. It sure does. <coughs> and it's those, those boards that the, that the seat are sitting on are kind of unique that it's got its own little board with the seats up. Right. And it comes up. I don't think I see that a lot. And those come up, don't they? They're just uh, right. they slid lift in off. there. Yep. Yeah. Hmm. A lot of the double boxes had that up to get you up a little higher. Yeah. The triple boxes, most of the time, the seat just sat on the top board. Uh, occasionally, you see it. It did give you a place to keep your feet to get them up a little bit higher. The, the wagon was totally full of corn or whatever you had in it. It's got this kind of scallop with this wave on the front. Oh, yeah. It's got some nice little features. Yeah, they definitely, you know, uh, made the way look attractive. It. You know, they cared about it. Yeah. This is a belly dump dirt wagon. It's it is all original. Some of the boards aren't perfect on it, but um, uh, it's still a usable unit. Yet, um, basically, it was used for hauling primarily dirt, rock, gravel. Uh, I heard they were used once in a while for coal, but uh, I've got a picture of one of these with uh, a team of horses on the front, and they had an elevating scraper. That's a horse-drawn elevating scraper, 
and they had 16 horses <clears throat> on the front of this scraper. And that, they had a long pole, almost the size of a telephone pole, that went through it. And you actually had four horses behind the scraper that pushed, and the rest of them just pulled the scraper. And it elevated to the side into these wagons. And after a couple of the farmers back in the day that had used these, they said when they'd build a big road, and there would be 50 of these wagons in line, one would get full and pull out just the way we do it today, only we use big elevating scrapers and big belly dump dirt trails. But the concept is the same over 100 years ago as what it is today. This is a Keller steel wheel box wagon. It is a triple box. And that, uh, uh, in later years, and that, a lot of the wagons went to a steel wheel wagon and that, and it was lower maintenance than the wooden wheel wagons. And you have the problem with the spokes getting loose in the fellows out here with this type of wagon. And that, uh, uh, so the, the later box wagons, a lot of those were steel. Is Keller a fairly common name you run across? No. Yeah, I never. I've never seen another one, to be honest right, with you. Right, me <clears throat> I've never seen another one. No. And I'm not a big steel wheel wagon <coughs> collector, and that, but uh, one of the reasons I got it because it was a Keller. I hadn't seen a Keller before. It's hard to imagine today, but back then, wagons were like farm implements today, in the sense that. There were a lot of them. Oh, there had to be. There were a lot of carriages. There were a lot of wagons. There were a lot of mowers. There was just so many plows. Um, there had to be so many manufactured and sold and transported. It's hard to imagine because they were everywhere. Right. You used a wagon, basically. A lot of farmers just kept feet on a wagon, and they, and they fed off off the wagon. And then you needed another wagon for another type of feed or hay or 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 whatever. You need a wagon for transporting things, if it was logs or, or whatever, you used a wagon. So a lot of farmsteads had a half a dozen or more wagons. And then the farmsteads were 100, 120 acres. So there were a lot of them, So and each of them had a bunch of wagons. So that's oh, right. an awful right. lot of wagons, yeah. Yeah, and there was a lot of farmsteads that weren't 120 acres. Right. They had a 40 or an 80, and right. became 120 later on. Right, exactly. Do you think this ha originally had a different running gear with um, the way that it's got these, these iron plates maybe? It's possible. It's possible. It's always hard to know. Or it could have been made for that and never, never got, and then it just got put on mm -hmm. the metal running gear from the very beginning. And with the steel wheel wagon, you just about have to have some type of protection on the box because it will eat into the box sure. real quick when you turn. And that, and the worst, worst thing that can happen if you've driven before with a box wagon, because they don't turn short at all. Right. If that wheel grabs that box, yep. we're going for a ride. It's yep. going over. Yep. So uh, it really is important that they don't dig into the box. That they do slide, and that you know. Yep. Hopefully, if worse comes to worse, the tongue breaks rather than the box going over. I've I've seen both. <laughs> I've seen both, but. That's the lesser of the evils. Yeah, the tongue's easier to repair. Uh, this is a Deer and Weber flax type wagon, um, 125 bushel. It's a big wagon. It's a flare box wagon and a very heavily constructed wagon. Here again is a good example. It's got the mountain wheels. It's got the four inch wide rims on it. And uh, it's a very heavy duty wagon uh, used for carrying a, a very heavy load. And uh, you can see with the flare box side on it, um, it will carry a heavy load. And it says flax tight. Is that flax because tight. flax seed is really small? Flax seed is, is, is small. Um, I guess they could have said wheat tight or okay. canola tight or something like too. But, but uh, I guess it was their way of saying it's, it's a, a wagon that will hold a, a small grain. You know? 125 bushels is pretty big. That's a big that's, wagon. That is. Very big wagon. I mean, by, by today's standards, by, that's pretty yeah, big. Right. It's, <clears throat> it's, it's, that's a very big wagon. Well, we have an indication here of your um, restoration work. Yeah, we, we did that in just right. I haven't got that uh, painted yet, no. but yeah, that's, yeah. we've 
I had to repair the woodwork on some of these wagons and that. And here we've got some homemade repair back homemade on part of the farmer there. stopping that crap. Yeah. yeah. I just haven't gotten around to it. We, <clears throat> we computer matched this paint and I do have the paint. To, do you really? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Just took a piece in and they can really get close to anything with that. This is something. This is cast here, right? Yeah, these yeah, these are castings. Ah, that that's is just a, that another is. reason. I mean that really holds that this, yeah. this wagon will hold its shape and you know uh, going through ditches and dips and that kind of stuff. Yeah, this whole wall is being held up by this by post. These, yeah, these castings, yep. Yeah. This is a Mills adjustable bed wagon. And basically what this wagon did, you could take these pieces right here and pull them up. These front, both sides would come up, come out, lay over, and at any angle, you could put them at a, at a 30, 45, or actually make a flat wagon out of it. So it made a very universal wagon to use for hauling hay, straw. Uh, you could set the sides up like this, and, and it was a tight wagon for hauling wheat, corn, beans, whatever, to the elevator. So it, it had a lot of uses for a person that just wanted to have a limited wagon or limited number of wagons. It had a lot of uses. And that, it's one of the only ones I've ever seen. And that, uh, uh, it's got a nice cut under there. For the it is cut years. under for turning short and getting around, which, you know, that's something you wish a lot of wagons had. And, but very few did and that but you can see right here that wheel fit under there and it'll probably go almost to where it rubs here on the on the pole in the middle uh, <clears throat> this is a bisher wagon right here uh triple blocks uh, doesn't have the mountain wheels on it but it's still a pretty heavy duty wagon it's, it's in pretty nice shape yet uh, it's got the end gate that you can <clears throat> throttle uh, it was made in Noblesville, Indiana, and that Indiana had quite a few uh, wagon towns in it. Um, I think the town of Goshen had several wagon companies in it. You hear that name a lot in, in the box wagon world. Um, but uh, and I think there was a lot of just small town blacksmith shops, uh, cabinet shops, and that that just made a limited number of wagons for their local people. A little different type of end game. Corp. Last on the list. It's a big one. I mean, it's much bigger than the one down below. It's bigger than the one down below. I can't validate. I was told when I bought it that it was pre 1800s, which it could be. I can't swear to it, but that's what I was told when I bought it. It was a very, very old card. Probably American? I would think. Yeah. But when I really look at it, I really, I, I, I got my wonders the way this right. is all made back here like this, you know? Right, right. It sure seems like it's got yeah. European influence. Right. Um, Thanks for joining us today at Rural Heritage and RFD TV, where we borrow from yesterday to do the work of today. This program is available for purchase. To order your copy, please call 319-362-3027 or visit www.ruralheritage.com. Rural Heritage is a bi-monthly magazine dedicated to draft animal farming and logging, as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. It is published by Mishka Press, which also offers a complete line of back-to-the-land books, DVDs, and calendars. Call or write for a catalog or subscription information. Or visit our website at www.ruralheritage.com.